I've already briefly discussed oxymercuration in the presence of methanol as the solvent and without a methyl at this position, but since we've already done the simple case, the mechanism is very similar either way, I thought I'd go ahead and illustrate oxymercuration with the more complex case from the outset. So we have a double bond. We have a mercury which can serve largely like the Br plus side of the bromine did in the first place. So mechanistically, this is going to start exactly the same as that previous problem. This double bond will go ahead and be attacking the mercury itself at the same time as one of these ligands leave. A pair of electrons that's on the mercury will come back and make a bond to the other side of the mercury of the double bond. The result is three arrows must be drawn, double bond to the mercury, ligand leaves, pair of electrons from the mercury back to the double bond, which leads to an intermediate. One way of thinking about that is that we have this double bond, which is going to get close to this mercury or vice versa, largely because the mercury has sort of delta plus character on it, but the mercury also has a pair of electrons. So again, what has to happen is the double bond will make a bond, whereas a pair of electrons from the mercury will go ahead and go back. For variety, what I've done is illustrate the mercury coming from the bottom, and much like the previous example, and now I've drawn it in a slightly more suggestive manner, the bond between the secondary side and the mercury is going to be very strong, and there's going to be a much weaker bond between the mercury and the tertiary side of the system. Again, strong bond to the secondary side, weaker bond to the tertiary side, and that's because the tertiary side can better tolerate having the plus. So we're going to draw a formal plus on the mercury, but in practice what that really means is that there's a lot of electron density missing from the tertiary side. So let me go ahead and draw the intermediate. Specifically what I have illustrated over here with the mercury attacking from the bottom or being attacked from the double bond from on top leading to this sort of structure is what I've illustrated right here. This is the mercury ion species that forms. And what you have is some electron density between the mercury and both the tertiary and secondary positions. If the mercury is back in the room behind me, then the methyl is coming out toward you. But of course, this was an arbitrary choice. This is flat and the mercury could come from the back or from the top. So you end up making a 50-50 mix at this point. But now we must consider what happens when when our solvent adds. In this case, the ligands are non-nucleophilic. Acetate is not a particularly good nucleophile, but we do have water as the solvent and water will be the thing that adds. As before, water will tend to go and attack the more cationic side, which is to say the tertiary side as opposed to the secondary side. So it will tend to add to this position. This will again be an SN2-like process in terms of the stereochemical outcome. And again, this is possible to happen largely because it's not a real sp3 center. This carbon is much more sp2-like in its character, much less like the sp3 center it appears to be as we draw it out. The outcome is a protonated alcohol. The mercury and methyl will end up on the same side, again, because what we have done is now invert the stereochemical chemistry at this position. Water will be on the opposite side. The solvent can come by and deprotonate this water, which then leads to the material that you isolate after this first single step. We are making a racemic mixture of both alcohols. The one where the mercury is on the back and the alcohol is coming toward you, and the one where the mercury is toward you and the alcohol is back. The mercury and the methyl will be on the same side. The oxygen will be opposite the mercury. The oxygen must be anti to the mercury based on the mechanism that we just drew out. I have this listed as isolated because we almost never care about the mercury product. Instead, this is merely step one of a two-step sequence. The second step in an oxymercuration reduction sequence is going to be a mechanism that I will call magic. I will show you how it works, but you don't need to know how it works. What you do need to know is that in the reduction step, the oxymercuration is the first step, reduction is the second step, what we do is reduce the carbon-mercury bond bond down to a carbon hydrogen bond and the reagent that accomplishes that is sodium borohydride. As far as you're concerned again you don't need to know how this works. In practice what happens is that you replace the carbon mercury bond with a carbon hydrogen bond. And what we do is we take this racemic mixture and remove the thing that's making it possible to distinguish between the two enantiomers. What we now have is a plane of symmetry right here. This is an achiral molecule. Oxymercuration and reduction. Two-step sequence 
sense, the result is that you end up adding water across the double bonds so that you have an alcohol. If the solvent is different, then you can make an ether, but what you're not going to do is usually isolate and use the mercury product. Step one makes it, step two removes the mercury, replaces it with a hydrogen.